Hi friends, this is Malay here. I am here to read another chapter of Gordon Corman's book, Restart. So uh, we, I've read two chapters of this so far. Uh, the first one was told by the main character, Chase's point of view, and it was him coming out of a coma and realizing that he didn't remember a lot of things about himself before he fell off his roof of his house and got a concussion and amnesia. And he started to realize that he wasn't sure the kind of person that he was uh, before that accident. And then in chapter two, we switched perspectives to Shoshana. And Shoshana was talking about her brother, Joel, and how Joel was away at a different school because of something that happened with Chase and his buddies uh, that forced his parents, her parents, I should say, to send Joel away to a different school to get him away from the bullying of Chase and his buddies. So the very last sentence in chapter two was like he hadn't planned, like he hadn't played a starring role in destroying my family. So I want to know exactly what happened with Chase and his friends to Joel that would force his parents to send him to a different school. That seems like a pretty drastic measure, right? So something had to happen that was pretty bad. And the author's giving us clues about that, but has not come out and said what had actually happened yet. So now we're in chapter three, uh, and it's back to Chase Ambrose's perspective. So here we go. I recognize the school, not because I remember it, it's just that mom drove me by here a few times over the last couple of weeks to make sure I'd be sort of familiar with the place. It's called Hiawassee Middle School. And it turns out I'm the star of just about every team they have, or X star. Until further notice, I'm on the disabled list, meaning he can't play because he's hurt. I get this information from my mother on the drive to my first day of eighth grade. It's just the two of us now since Johnny's back at college. Mom's trying to fill me in on my former life so I won't be caught by surprise. Like when that psycho girl dumped frozen yogurt on my head. Remember that was Shoshana? Funny, she was sympathetic when I told her about that, but she didn't seem very surprised. Like we live in a town where people attack each other with desserts all the time. Oh, she replied airily, young girls can be oversensitive especially with a popular athlete. She smiles at you. You don't smile back. You know, she takes it personally. But I did smile. She's the one who didn't. She went straight for the yogurt. She rolled her eyes. What do you want me to say, honey? I don't even know who this mystery yogurt bomber is. But here's the thing. I think she did know, or at least she could make a pretty good guess. Why would she hold that back? It wasn't like those first days out of the hospital when she was a stranger to me, and I must have seemed plenty unfamiliar to her. This makes me think a little bit of time has passed since the first chapter when he got out of the hospital. Now, as we pull to the curb in front of the school, she's pumping me up with details like names of friends and teachers I get along with, yet I still can't shake the impression that there's something being left unsaid. But, I prompt, she reddens, but what? I put it to her. Tell me the part you're leaving out. 13 years is a long time, Chase. There's no way I can fill all that empty space for you while we're parked at the side of the road on the first day of school. You're going to hear things about yourself, good and bad, that might surprise you. Just keep your cool, okay? Now what's that supposed to mean? I asked, she answered, and now somehow I know even less than I did before. Her face is the color of an overripe tomato. I don't push it. I guess I'll find out soon enough. There are hundreds of kids pouring in the front entrance. Everybody seems to know everybody else. Back slaps and high fives fly everywhere. Several of them fly in my direction and I smack hands, bump fists, and try to look like I belong, which I definitely don't. I also get some strange looks and a few kids meet my eyes and then furtively look away. I'm guessing this has something to do with the scrape on my face and my immobilized arm and shoulder. Immobilized means can't move. Mom warned me that a lot of people probably heard about my accident, but nobody knows the amnesia part. I have to get ready to explain that to a lot of friends who can't figure out why I don't recognize them. The teachers and office staff had to be told, of course. It's our boy, 
A single bellow rises above the general chatter as soon as I enter the building. I don't know the kid, but I'm willing to bet he's one of my football buddies, judging by the size of him. From out of the hubbub of the foyer, guys who are almost as big are converging on me, slapping at me and calling me their boy. Guys, guys, not the shoulder. My mind is reeling. How am I going to explain to this welcoming crowd that I haven't got the faintest idea who any of them are? I start to feel a little dizzy. Chase, two more football players elbow their way to me to my side. My surprise, I actually recognize this pair. They're the guys from the pumpkin smashing picture on my phone. Mom pointed them out in my lacrosse team photo as Aaron and Bear. Apparently, they're my best friends. Dude, good to have you back, barks Aaron, the taller of the two. In person, he has the closest thing to a full beard I've ever seen on a middle schooler. We tried to come by, but your mom said you are on bed rest. Yeah, I can't believe you're here, chimes in one of the other guys. Didn't you jump off the clock tower on the village green? Bear whaps him hard across the face. He jumped off his roof, moron. If he jumped off the clock tower, he'd be dead. And he didn't jump. He fell. Who'd be stupid enough to jump off a roof? Aaron adds. This was pretty stupid too, I admit, a little taken aback by that full face smash and the fact that the kid on the receiving end didn't seem to mind it. I can't remember what I was thinking. In fact, you guys, to be honest, the slappy cuts me off, but you're going to be healed up in time for football season, right? You'll be ready for our first game. The doctor says no. It's my shoulder, but mostly it's the concussion. I can't risk taking a headshot so soon after the accident. A howl of protest greets this announcement. But we need you. You're a leading scorer, the best player, our captain. Cut it out, guys, Aaron orders. Injuries are a part of the game. We all know that. To me, he adds, listen, man, we have to talk to you. He heads out of the foyer to an inner atrium with hallways leading off it. We have no problem navigating the dense crowd. My two best friends just push people out of the way. Most kids see the three of us and clear out on their own. They lead me to a bench along the wall. Are these seats taken? I ask a youngish boy, maybe a sixth grader. Before he can answer, Bear rumbles, they are now. The kid scrambles down the hall, propelled by a hefty shove. I sit down with my fellow pumpkin smashers. Before they can say anything, I burst out with, Aaron, Bear, the names are unfamiliar on my tongue, like I've never spoken them before. I've got something to tell you. When I fell off that roof, I got more than a concussion and a sprained shoulder. I got amnesia too. Bear frowns. Amnesia? You mean you forget stuff? I shake my head sadly. Worse, I forgot everything, like my whole life before I fell. I motion around us. The school, these people, all new to me. I wouldn't even know you guys except your pictures are on my phone. As it is, I don't remember anything about us. I know we're friends because my mother said so, but everything we did together, it's gone. I catch them eyeing each other like they don't believe me. It makes me mad until I consider how I would react if a longtime friend told me the same thing. Here I am, the kid they've known all their lives. I look the same, I talk the same, and I'm telling them that all our history is completely wiped out. I don't blame them for thinking I'm joking. It is a joke. Just not a funny one. I speak again. It's not just you guys. Think how it feels to see some random stranger instead of your own mother, your brother, your dad. And trust me, I'm not loving the thought of dealing with 800 kids in this school who think I'm dissing them because I can't remember who they are. Bear stares at me hard. Wait, you're not kidding, are you? I wish, I say fervently. He's stunned. Wow. Aaron leans forward practically in my face. Yeah, but your memory's going to come back, right? There's an urgency in his voice. He must really hate it that I'm missing out on the good old days. Some of it, maybe, I reply, but also maybe not. The doctor says it's impossible to know. They look at each other again, and there's no mistaking how freaked out they are. I feel a surge of warmth toward these two, my best friends. I have a giddy vision of my phone screen, the three of us brandishing the base baseball bat with the ruined jack-o'-lantern the good times. Guys, I try to reason with them. I'm still me, even if I don't remember the stuff we did together. We'll do new stuff, better stuff. 
Oh, yeah, totally, Bear exclaims. And if you can't play football, you'll be good for, for lacrosse in the spring, right? The doctor said I should be okay by then, although we'll have to see. There you go, he sounds upbeat, although I'm pretty sure he's faking it. This can't be an easy thing to process. If I wasn't the one with amnesia, I don't know if I could accept it myself. We're here for you, man, Aaron adds, slapping my back and sending a jolt of fire through my separated shoulder. I swallow an angry warning. One step at a time. Welcome back. Welcome back, boys, a deep voice intones. A tall man in a charcoal gray suit approaches our bench. Chase, I'm Dr. Fitzwallace, your principal. I thought I'd reintroduce myself under the circumstances. We've met before, of course. A strangled, you can say that again, comes from Bear. The principal silences him with a single look through steel-rimmed glasses. Chase, come with me. Let's have a little chat. My friends are already slouching off down the hall, so I follow the principal into his office. On the wall are two large framed photographs, and I'm surprised when I, when I identify one of them. It's on my wall, too, part of a newspaper clipping about our football championship last year. It's me, helmet pushed onto the back of my head, hoisting the trophy. Hoisting means lifting. The other is similar, although you can tell it's a lot older. The pose is almost identical, a young player raising the same trophy. I can't explain it, but the kid looks sort of familiar. But that's crazy. How can I recognize him? I don't recognize anybody. Dr. Fitzwallace is watching me. That's your father, our only other win at state, back when he was your age. Wow. No wonder dad calls me champ. I should call him champ too. I tell the principal, I didn't know he won at state. I mean, I'm sure I knew at one point. That's exactly what I'd like to talk to you about. Have a seat, Chase. Dr. Fitzwallis weighs me into a chair. I have to confess, this is a first for me. I've never had a student suffer amnesia before. It must be very upsetting for you, even a little frightening. It's pretty weird, I admit. Not remembering anybody, it's like I'm surrounded by all these people, but I'm still alone. The principal sits down behind his desk. I hope we can even make this situation a little easier for you. I've alerted all the teachers and support staff, so we're ready for you. If you have any issues, just have whoever's involved get in touch with me. I thank him because that's what he seems to expect me to do. One more thing. He leans back in his chair, and when he speaks again, it's slowly and carefully as if he's trying to get his words exactly right. This is an awful thing that's happened to you, but it's also presenting you with a rare opportunity. You have the chance to rebuild yourself from the ground up, to make a completely fresh start. Don't squander it. I'm sure you're not feeling very lucky. Squander means waste. Don't squander it. I'm sure you're not feeling very lucky, but there are millions of people who'd give anything to stand right where you stand now, in front of a completely blank canvas. I stare back at my principal. What's he talking about? I'm struggling to discover the person I was and he wants me to change? What's so, what was so wrong about the old me that now I have to be somebody else? So boys and girls, that's the end of chapter three. Uh, and we're left again wondering what kind of person Chase was before the accident. We've had some clues about that. I want you to think about that. What kind of person was Chase before the accident? What clues have we had? And what kind of words might you use to describe him based on what we know so far in these beginning chapters of the book? Remember that it's important to think about how characters grow and change in books, and to be able to do that, we have to consider how they are at the beginning of the book and compare that to how they are at the end of the book. Okay, guys, that's it for today. See you tomorrow for our next chapter of Restart by Gordon Corman. Bye-bye.